really, I think the, 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 the important uh, uh, architecture of the European integration is about the what. And this is a very complex architecture. It's a very complex architecture because the drivers are very complex. And this was, I think, very well uh, described by, uh, by uh, Alan. Uh, this is a driver that is historical. History has a big weight on, on what has happened uh, in Europe. And the future has also a big weight, the vision of uh, an integrated uh, uh, Europe. So the drivers are very complex, and I don't think we have the same drivers in other, uh, in other process. The objectives couldn't be more complex. There are uh, three big uh, objectives of the European process, the political objectives, the economic objectives, and uh, what, we, what I call the functional cooperation objectives. Luke was referring to this as the platform for providing other types of public goods uh, uh, in, uh, in the context of uh, uh, integration. And the instruments are also, are also very complex, how you actually <coughs> design and implement common policies and common uh, institutions. There has been a discussion in the presentations on how the European uh, solution to this architecture, and the European solution to this architecture, uh, at the bottom I have what Andre was talking about, the stages. There has been a particular way in staging the sequencing, but that doesn't have to be the unique solution. This is a particular way of the EU solving a very complex architecture of integration. Again, that have very complex drivers, very complex objectives, and very complex uh, uh, instruments. And there has been a lot, I think, also of uh, 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 commonalities in the analysis of what, the, what we mean by uh, uh, political, economic, and functional cooperation objectives and, uh, and policies. And here I would like to highlight two issues in these presentations. The concept of convergence, I think this is what's really behind the construction of the European project, uh, how you actually put the project uh, in place that will uh, make the political preference of the national states to converge to some sort of uh, uh, unique, uh, unique political uh, process. The same thing for economic convergence, what's this, the process that you put in place for achieving some uh, economic convergence in different uh, areas. Uh, and the same thing on, on other uh, uh, areas of cooperation, security issues, transportation issues, uh, and other issues. Uh, uh, Andre, I think, has made a very good point. Uh, the, the issue of convergence, uh, if this is an issue of a precondition or if it's an issue of, uh, of an objective uh, uh, of, the, of the European process. And I think in the area of the instruments, especially, specifically on the, on the policies and the institutions, I think the discussion has been around the issues of uh, flexibility. We need strong binding uh, institutions, binding policies, but with some degrees of flexibility to, uh, 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 to, ex to absorb uh, an increasing process of uh, deep integration and uh, more partners in this, uh, in this project. This is the way I summarize the, the presentation. The second uh, part is really convince you that we are uh, in a time, uh, in, in a kind of an inflection point in terms of uh, regional integration around the world. I'm going to put the cases of uh, Latin America, that is the one that I, uh, the case that I know better, and also the case of Asia. I think you can say similar things for uh, the Middle East, probably projects of integration and, and, and Africa as, uh, as well. And here the point is that uh, up to the mid-90s, some of the projects of integration, and this is very clear in, in South America, in Latin America, they were really modeled after the EU uh, process. The, uh, the initial stages of the CARICOM, the Central America Common Market, the Indian community, a little bit less so the Mercosur, but also in, in, to some degree, they were really modeled around the, uh, the process of the integration rather than the contents of the, uh, process, the integration in, in Europe. This is changing quite a lot uh, of, what is uh, uh, of what is happening today in, in integration. This is the picture that one can take, uh, what I call the pre-94 model, and I'll tell you why I chose the 1994 uh, uh, date here. Uh, in America, we had four projects of integration, the Caribbean, CARICOM project, the Central America, the Indian community, and the Mercosur. In Asia, there was a similar project uh, with their peculiarities, the ASEAN project, who were really, really uh, designed with the EU model uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in mind. 94 changes quite a lot uh, all this, uh, uh, all this uh, framework for integration. First, uh, there's a process of trying what I call here the ravioli model, and I put the, the Italian uh, menu here, menu here because of the, the, uh, was, uh, the concept of spaghetti model that we have in when we talk about integration. They were really in a time around 94 
several projects of integration that are trying to put more content in this process of integration. And the most clear case in our, case, in our region was the Mercosur in 94 with the implementation of the Customs uh, Union project, as, as uh, was mentioned, very difficult, very difficult project to, to accomplish. And the uh, launching of the NAFTA agreement, which is the first north-south uh, uh, FDA project in, uh, in our region. And the, in ASEAN, the 93 uh, 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 timeline marks the implementation of the FTA in, uh, in ASEAN. ASEAN was more a cooperation project. 93 is the implementation of the AFTA or the FTA project in, uh, in, this, uh, in this region. But 94 also sees uh, at the same time uh, other projects, what I call here the pizza project, which is trying to uh, start looking at larger initiatives of integration around the world. Uh, one is the APEC, which is a very loose mode of integration. But in 1994, they launched what they call the Bogor Goals, which is specific goals of achieving trade liberalization in a specific, uh, in a specific timeline. Again, this uh, happens in, in 1994. A huge project in the Americas, a historical project uh, launched in 1994, the FTAA. Uh, under the summit of the Americas. This was uh, an ambitious project to create an FTA around the whole hemisphere, including the US and, uh, and Canada. And coincidentally, it was also launched in 1994. And of course, all of this was happening in the context, not, uh, not coincidental, of uh, uh, the Uruguay, the finalization of the Uruguay uh, round, 94, and uh, uh, entering into force of the WTO in January 1995. So the architecture of integration is changing rapidly around this, uh, around this time. But after 94, all these projects really stumble, uh, some uh, more rapidly than, uh, than others. And what we have seen as a, mode of, as a principal mode of integration across uh, in Asia, in Latin America, in the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, trans uh, uh, geography and also in other regions, uh, what we have called the spaghetti ball in our region or the noodle ball in, in Asia is really a mode of integration based on bilateral FTAs, mostly bilateral, sometimes trilateral FTAs. But this is really the uh, process in which countries have looked into integration after uh, uh, around mid, uh, uh, mid 90s. What we see today, and this is something very new, what is happening in both regions, and again, I think it's very similar in other uh, parts of the world, is what I call here uh, a lasagna process. There's some very interesting initiatives in many, many parts of the world trying to, what we call, flatten out this uh, RTA project. There's initiatives in Asia, uh, like the ASEAN Plus 6 process, the ASEAN Plus 3, a more ambitious process like the East, uh, the East Asian community or the Asia Pacific community launched by Australia and, uh, and Japan uh, that try to uh, pull together some of the uh, agreements and some of the uh, uh, achievements that has been done uh, mostly through FTAA type of uh, uh, integration, trade integration. Uh, same thing is happening uh, in the, at the Trans-Pacific level. There's a very interesting initiatives trying to link some of the FTAs uh, that have been signed between uh, Latin American countries and Asian countries, or America's countries and, uh, and, uh, and Asian countries. Uh, and I'm referring here especially a very interesting initiative, uh, uh, which is called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which involves a few countries uh, in Asia, in Latin America, and, uh, uh, and the US. And very similar things are happening in, uh, in South America. This uh, very interesting initiative uh, among the ARCO countries is the Pacific countries, all the countries in our region that touch the Pacific, from Mexico to Chile, that they are trying to look for ways in uh, converging their own FTAs that they have been signed in the last 10, 15, uh, 15 years. This is, this is what's happening in terms of the priorities for integration uh, in these two regions, but I think there are similar things happening in other, uh, in other regions. And my last slide is really trying to uh, reflect on the EU experience on this new reality. As I said, I think pre-94, lots of the models that we had in integration really had as a vision the EU model. Uh, today, uh, my, my, uh, my point here is that given the, the new reality of integration, this, this model is probably less relevant as a whole model, but maybe we can take some specific, uh, uh, some specific lessons on very specific uh, issues. First point is that this emerging new regional integration that is, uh, is happening is a kind of a marketplace for future integration. There's really uh, an exploratory uh, time for many countries in looking at what could be the final landscape for integration. 
Uh, and I think the questions that uh, have been asked about the EU are still relevant in terms of asking what's may, what may happen in the near future. Uh, 